God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church but to be empty. The third proof of the resurrection are signs and wonders. Jesus was speaking in Mark 16, 17. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. He said, in my name shall they cast out devils. He said, they shall speak with new tongues. If you go to verse 18, he kept giving many, many of such signs. So you will notice that one of the insurance of a Christian is his faith in the resurrection. The more you believe in the resurrection, the more you see supernatural signs manifesting in your life. And I'm not preaching to you what I read in the book. I've traveled around the world and I have seen this thing happen with those who are professing Christians and those who are not Christians. When I went to Pakistan to preach, they didn't tell them anything about Jesus. They didn't tell them anything about Christianity. They just told them a healer is coming. And I didn't know. When I was coming into the meeting, I saw over 50 buses packed. And I said, where are all these people coming from? They said they brought them from different villages. Why did they turn up so much? They said, no, they told him a healer is coming. I said, I thought you told me you are looking for revival. When did the message turn to a healer is coming? <laughs> when I came there to make things worse, they were not speaking English. So I had to reduce my message to a message that a six-year-old can understand. And all I told them is, man fell into sin and the only thing available to man was judgment for the wages of sin is death and there's nothing you can do about your sins because the standard of god is not the standard of man the standard of god is always 100 percent it's not that when you do good and your good supersede your evil you will go to heaven that's a joke if i bake cake now and i give you to eat and you want to eat i say hey sorry i put some animal dung the feces of my cow I put very little inside but I mean the the floor in the in, in inside is more than the dung you, you will now eat and say they small that's not how it works so the standard of God does not tolerate the the, the least impurity that's how God works if I give you water now and I say uh, uh, you can drink but uh, don't worry I put uh, for my the heart i call a chemical that can kill you i say i put some there but don't worry just drink the water is much will you drink and you say the, the quantity is small if you understand the danger of little impurity how do you think the god that the bible said his eyes cannot behold iniquity will now look your life and weigh you and say your good supersede your evil that's not how god works god's standard is perfect and completely perfect and so when God saw that we fell, God sent us a savior. And the price for sin is death. That was why the savior died. And so when he died, everyone who believes his labor is accredited to that person. Just like if I'm owing you a thousand dollars and somebody shows up, I can't pay. And he says, I've paid for you or he has paid for me. If I accept that payment, then I am free of that debt not because I paid but because somebody who had capacity paid and paid completely that was what Jesus came to do for us and when he resurrected it's a proof that when we die there's hope of all the men that are believed in and worship on earth not one of them said there was hope after life only Jesus said I will die and I will rise again there's no other religious leader that said he will die with precision and say he will rise again so every of them is hoping for whatever they see in eternity only jesus said i will rise again and he didn't just say i will rise again he said when i go to the father i will prepare a place for you so he spoke about eternity with precision and audacity and the way he validated it is that if you believe it it's not until you come over right here while you are here signs and wonders will begin to follow you as a proof that what I told you is not a lie. It can be justified. Are you seeing that? So when Christians go out and they see signs and wonders, it's a proof that the resurrection is not a lie. It said, these signs shall follow them that believe.
And so I preached that message to them in Pakistan. When I finished, I didn't sense any anointing. I told myself, you are finished today. I now went back. And the people were waiting for the healer. That's the first message they want to hear. When I saw that nothing was working, I said, okay, stand up. If you are sick, stand up. This is your time. And trust me, there are sick people in the world. I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And the Holy Ghost went to work. I was not feeling anything, but the Holy Ghost was working. Terrible things. A woman shouted and said she can see. She was blind. They led her to the meeting. Eyes open. Another one shouted that she can hear. The people were trying to understand. Then they started bringing babies. Babies who didn't even hear the message. Babies that didn't even have faith. The other one, there was the bone was protruded with a swollen on the chest. The bone went back and the swollen vanished. That was when everybody started shouting. When I saw that Jesus was doing his work, the next one I went for, when I finished teaching, I said, no, this thing I'm telling you, you would think I came with magic. No, I now caught somebody. I said, come. I said, you to give command in the name of Jesus. The guy gave command and healing started taking place. That was how Pakistan erupted. We are not believing what is written in the textbook. In Christianity, what we believe, we can demonstrate. If not that all of you are Christians here, I would have said somebody who has a challenge will come. And I would have prayed for the person to be healed now. So that you know this is not textbook. I'm not trying to defend the Bible. I'm not trying to defend the document. Christianity is something that you experience. That's why it brings liberty. I'm not trying to prove or defend what Jesus said or what the prophet said. I can prove it. And the way I prove it is that signs and wonders will follow. When you talk and something happens, somebody will know that there's a spirit behind what you are saying. So that's the second sign of the resurrection in acts chapter 3 from verse 6 and 8 peter and john were going to the place of prayer and the bible said they saw an impotent man and the man asked them for help and peter said look on us he says silver and gold have i known he says such as i have i give you and in verse 6 he said in the name of jesus rise up and walk and he put the man up and the man started walking this is not defending a book this is demonstrating the truth of the word of god that this thing we believe is a reality it's a life it's not just a hope it's something we can demonstrate so if you believe in the resurrection the proof is the signs and the wonders and these signs and wonders are not for apostles and prophets it said these signs will follow everyone that believe and then number four the resurrection is substantiated by the testimony of the holy scriptures in first corinthians 15 from verse 3 to verse 4 when paul was speaking he said i deliver unto you that which also i received how that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and in verse 4 he said and that he was buried so jesus didn't faint he died and he was buried and he was buried for three days he said he rose again on the third day according to scriptures so there are testimonies of scriptures like i read from the beginning that proves the resurrection of jesus so four major proof is proofs are the conviction of the apostles they believed it until they died for it number two is the conviction of the holy spirit in our hearts number three is the manifestation of signs and wonders through the life of those who believe and number four is the testimony of the holy scripture this thing is a faith-based reality and so the only extra biblical argument we can present for the resurrection are the consistent historical facts that have been verified otherwise it's a faith movement and this is what we believe and we have proofs to back them up now, when Jesus resurrected, he didn't just resurrect and escape to heaven. He showed us his body. He showed us what a resurrected person looks like. Now, aside the fact that this comes to prove that he actually rose from the dead, this also reveals to us what we shall be like when we are resurrected. You know, one thing about the Bible that makes the Bible so beautiful is that the Bible speaks with precision. 
There are no gray areas or vague arguments. There are precision. For example, as touching the beginning of the world, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said the earth became void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God came and said, let there be light. He told us how the sun was created. He told us how animals, everything. The Bible is a book of precision. Because what he's saying is not an assumption. It's not a presupposition. It's a reality you can bank your life on. And the same applies to the resurrection. When Jesus resurrected, he showed us his body. So that we know what will happen to us when we too are resurrected. And so I'll give you 10, 10 dimensions that the body of Jesus carried. Which is what you and I will be like at the resurrection. So we are not just, we are not in confusion of what we will be like when we resurrect. We know exactly what we will be like when we are resurrected. We will sustain that same body that Jesus sustained. Look at what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 21. It said, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the walking whereby he's able even to subdue all things unto himself so he said he will convert our vile body to become like his glorious body so we know when we are resurrected we are going to be like our lord are you following that in first john chapter 3 verse 3 he said and every man that had this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure so we are being transformed so that we can be glorified so what the Holy Ghost is doing in us now is that as we keep believing in Jesus, he is transforming us. But at the resurrection, ultimately, all of us will be glorified. So we'll put on glorified bodies like he wore his glorified body. Now, what are the dimensions of the glorified body? So that you will know what you will look like in eternity. Number one, the resurrected body is a spiritual body. No longer a natural body. In John 20, 26, he said, and after eight days again, his disciples were with him and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and he stood in their midst and said, peace be unto you. So he came, the doors were shut, but he entered. That's a spiritual body. So his body was no longer limited by the material elements of this world. So when we too resurrect, our bodies will not be limited by this material world. So that's the first hope that we enjoy as believers. We know what will become of our body. Our bodies will become celestial in nature. It will not be limited by the elements of materiality. In 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it said it was sown a natural body, but it was raised a spiritual body. So every one of us here would eventually put on a spiritual body. Number two, that spiritual body is a body of flesh and bone not a body of flesh and blood what we are dealing with now is a body of flesh and blood and i've taught you why because every human being has three lives in him born again christian there is the life of the flesh which is in the blood that's why when you go to the hospital and they want to check what's wrong with you they take your blood sample everything about you is encoded there because that's where the fleshly life is there is the life of the soul which is called suke the Bible said it breathed into their nostrils, Genesis 2, 7, and they became a living soul. And then there is the life of the spirit, which is called Zoe. In Genesis 2, 9, man was supposed to eat of the tree of life, but he didn't because the devil deceived him. Now, in Christ, God brought back that life to us. At the resurrection, we are not going to put on this body. And because of that, we are not going to need the life of the flesh. And because we not need the life of the flesh, the flesh will be, the blood will will be taken away that's why the bible said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom corruption cannot inherit incorruptibility first corinthians 15 verse 50 in fact to corroborate this in luke 24 39 he said behold my hands when he was talking to thomas he said and my feet he said that it is myself he said handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have so jesus showed them that i am now made of flesh and bone you see that because the bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom so the resurrected body is not flesh and blood if it materializes in a celestial fashion it will be flesh and bone so today 
Jesus is sitting in heaven like a man but not flesh and blood rather flesh and bone in an immaterial reality number three the body we are going to have is a heavenly body not an earthly body that's the body God will give to us at the resurrection I'm showing you why Christianity begins with the resurrection because this will be your ticket to eternity that's why if you are not born again no matter how much good you do you cannot go to God's realm because it is in the resurrection that the celestial body is given to you that body is what will take you there it's just like an astronaut going to space you must be clothed with spacely suits if you don't wear it you can't go there if you go there you can't survive you see that this is why doing good is not enough you have to accept Jesus so that the power of the resurrection can prepare you at the resurrection so you can inherit that kingdom in first Corinthians 15 45 and 47 he said there is a natural body and there's a spiritual body he said and so it is written the first man Adam was made a living soul the last man Adam is made a quickening spirit he said the first man is of the earth earthy he said the second man is the Lord from heaven so when we receive Christ we receive of his life and his body that makes him function in the heavenly realm this is what Paul was speaking about in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 1 to 3 he said for we know that our earthly house speaking about our body he said of this tabernacle will be dissolved and he said we have a building of God a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens he said for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven if so be that we being clothed we shall we shall be found not being clothed we shall be found naked you see that so paul is saying we have a heavenly body and the time is coming when we'll be clothed with that heavenly body so when the rapture takes place everybody will be changed and when we are changed those of us who are in christ the garment will be made available to us number four this body is a glorified body you know currently the glory you have is locked on your inside the bible says we have this glory in earthen vessel that the excellency may be of god and not of man so every one of us here is carrying a measure of glory but that glory is on our inside at the resurrection what happens is that that glory will manifest that's what the resurrection will do for us so if we don't believe in the resurrection when men come into the fullness of their glorified beings or elements we will be stranded so the reason we believe in the resurrection is because when that time comes we want the glory on the inside to manifest on the outside at the mount of transfiguration in matthew 17 verse 1 and 2 jesus showed them a measure of that glory the bible said as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered his raiment began to glister and suddenly he began to shine you see that but that's not what it tide supposed to stop at the resurrection that's how every one of us will shine because we'll put on our glorified bodies number five that body is an immortal body no longer able to die but living according to the power of the endless life in revelation chapter 1 verse 18 jesus was speaking to john and he said i am he that liveth and was dead and behold i'm alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and death so jesus now lives forevermore because he is wearing a glorified body so when we too are resurrected and we wear this glorified body we are going to become immortal we will no longer be destroyed or destructible because we would have been clothed with immortality are you following that number six that body is not just immortal in that it can outlive everything the body is now immortal because it is no longer subject to sinful infirmities like taste hunger weariness tiredness all of those things will no longer be there because when we resurrect into our glorified body that body will become eternally powerful so it's an eternally powerful body not subject to the frailty of the fallen man or the infirmity of the sinful nature that's what the bible teaches in john 20 19 the bible said then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled together for fear 
he said jesus came and stood in their midst and said peace be unto you so he was not limited the body became literally unlimited because it is now immortalized so you can go a thousand years without drinking you can go a thousand years without being tired you can go a thousand years without being weary because you are now wearing immortalized body and you know on the mount of transfiguration when moses and elijah descended and stood with jesus in glory you saw that they were wearing something that looks like that such people don't need what to drink or what to eat these are the hopes that the resurrection avails and affords us are, are we together and then number seven that body is incorruptible and it is completely sinless because for us to stand before god we have to be sinless and incorruptible the bible said that oh lord out of a purer eyes it said your eyes cannot behold iniquity so we cannot hope to come into the family of god live with god in eternity and come there with sin so when we are resurrected we will be resurrected sinless and incorruptible in psalm 16 verse 9 and 10 when the psalmist was talking about jesus this is what he said prophetically he said my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth." he said my flesh also shall rest in hope for thou will not leave my soul in hell in hell neither shall thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption and in acts chapter 2 verse 31 and 32 peter corroborated it that what david was speaking about was not himself because david had been buried he said he was speaking about jesus so jesus rose from the grave incorruptible he rose from the grave undefined and the bible teaches us that the same way he rose that's how we are also going to resurrect with him are you seeing that in first corinthians 15 17 paul said and if christ be not raised he said your faith in is vain and you remain in your sins so what paul was teaching here is that because christ was risen from the dead your hope in his immortality is not vain and you too will not remain in your sin so the same way he rose incorruptible and sinless that's how you too will rise incorruptible and you will rise sinless so all of these things are dimensions of the body of a resurrected man and this is what we shall be like you know the bible said in first john chapter 3 from verse 1 he said behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us he said it does not yet appear what we shall be like he said but when we shall see him he said we shall also be like him so when we are resurrected we are going to be exactly like he is and these are some of the dimensions that he has shown us now as the intensity of glory increases this dimension will also increase in propensity because this descriptions i've given you is the descriptions the apostles recorded when jesus resurrected when john eventually saw him in revelation the glory had intensified to quotients that he could not fathom so much so that john almost could not recognize him and that's the realm eternal it's from glory to glory from power to power from dimensions to dimensions unending and every one of us will just be transfiguring into the likeness of god unending so this is the body that god is preparing for us so when we believed in jesus we didn't just believe in jesus to become part of a religious organization when we believe in jesus we were securing our eternity and one dimension of the security of eternity is that in the resurrection god gives us the life that jesus has so when we say jesus rose from the dead it means we are confirming that we believe in immortality so god gives us that life and then secondly at the resurrection we are prepared to receive of that body so that where he is we can be also because if we don't have that body we cannot be where he is are you following so this is the one of the major hopes of christianity and this is what res the resurrection makes available to us now why is the resurrection necessary i want to give you four reasons why the resurrection is necessary and you need to know this so that you can explain your faith because everything god does there's a reason for it there is a necessity for it that's why he does it god is not just acting or looking for what to do everything you find god doing there is a reason for which he's doing it and so there are four major reasons i want to give you tonight for the resurrection number one the resurrection proves the deity of christ because he came in the form of man 
but he was the son of God. You know, there are many people that argue, and what is their argument? Does God have a wife? How can God have a son? And you see that this argument, they don't even pass scholarly tests. Why is that so? Not every animal that gives birth has a wife. Even in the lowest level of life, the amoeba gives birth to a child without a wife. And that's the lowest realm of life. If at the lowest realm of life, an animal can produce an offspring without a child, is it at the God realm that is impossible? So you see that these things are, they are not spiritual arguments. They are actually mental arguments designed to discredit a belief system. And Moeba does not need a wife to give birth to a child. And God is superior to that realm. Is anything too hard for God to do? And when we say son of God, we are not necessarily saying God gave birth. When we say son of God, we are talking about an offspring of God in the sense that one that proceeds from the father. That's what we mean when we say son of God. When we say son of God, we are trying to explain God in flesh. Son of God simply means God became flesh or God put on flesh. So it's like God, God proceeded from God to function in a realm. And so God decided to come out of himself and operate in a realm. So it is the form that God assumes in that realm that we call son of God. Because that form proceeded from God. Are you seeing that? So if God, if God sends himself out of himself into a realm, that one that leaves God is like an offspring, the errand runner of God. So he came out of God. So when we say son of God, we are not talking biology. We are talking a reality beyond the realm of biology. And that's why if you study John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4 and verse 12 to verse 14, you'll see the way the Bible explains that principle. He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So, God spoke, but because he's God, his word is him. As I'm talking to you now, I'm not God. So, you can't see my word. My word is basically sound energy. But when God speaks, his word is as God as he is. That's why I say heaven and earth will pass away. Not one jot or tit of my word will fail. That's God operating as God. So he said, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. So he's telling you now that the word of God is God. And then he went further to say, the same was in the beginning with God. He said, all things were made by him, verse 3. And there was nothing else made that was made. So it was the word that made all things. The word God spoke. And then he came down to verse 11. That word that is God. That word that created all things. He said, go to verse 11. That word came into the world. Okay, go to verse 10. Because he's, he's giving you the history of the word. He said the word was in the beginning with God. The word was God. The word created all things. He now went further. He said he was in the world. The word was made by him. Now, he's using the word of God, but he's referring to the word of God as him. Because the word of God is God. He said the word was made by him, but the word knew him not. Are you seeing that? So, the word of God that created the word, entered the word that is created. He said, although the word he created was created by him, but the word did not recognize him. Are you seeing the difference? Now, go further. Verse 11 quickly he said he came unto his own his own received him not his own because he created all of us so we belong to him he said he came to us and we received him not because we didn't know him and we didn't accept that the word of god could come among what he created we were too sophisticated in our minds to believe in the possibilities of god so when he came to us he said we received him not go to verse 12 he said but as many as believed him to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even they that believe on his name. So those who are able to accept that the word of God that created the world came into the world and took on human flesh. He said they that believe, he said they too, he will give the right to become sons of God. But that's not my emphasis. Go further. My emphasis is in verse 14. 
He said, and the word. What did he say about the word? In verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. He said, and that word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of him as the only begotten of the father. So when we say son of God, we are not saying the father met a, a, or have a wife that he slept with. We are talking about the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word became flesh is the begotten of the father. So son of God means the word became flesh. So he said this word that became flesh is the only begotten. Because at this time, nobody had believed in him. At this time, he just came out of the father as the word. Now that he has taken on flesh, he has become the son of God. And he now says, God does not want to stop there. He says, as many as believe in him, they too, the father will consider to become like sons. This is where we become part of God's family. Because the word was made flesh. The word that was God was made flesh. And in being made flesh, he became the only begotten of the father. In us believing in him, he is no longer the only begotten of the father. He has become the first amongst many brethren. So we now, are part of the family of God. So Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is an invitation to become part of the family of God. Christianity is divinity expressed through humanity. That's why God can manifest through us. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing that? So when he was resurrected, the Bible said it proved his deity. Romans 1 verse 3 and 4. He proved that he was the son of God. That's what I mean by that. He said, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. But in verse 4, hear what he said. And declared to be what? The son of God. What does that mean? The word made flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So the first thing the resurrection wants to achieve is to prove that this Jesus is not just a prophet. He's greater than a prophet. It's to prove that this Jesus is not just an apostle. He's greater than an apostle. The resurrection proved that Jesus is the son of God. That he came from the father. Although he represents the office of the prophet, he represents the office of the apostle, he represents the office of the evangelist. He represents the office of the pastor. He represents the office of the teacher. But he is the word made flesh. And the proof is that he is the only one that has power over death. So resurrection means conquering the grave. Resurrection means power over death. No prophet has power over death. All of them came. They have died. They are still dead. The only one that conquered the grave is the one that is called the son of God and so all of us who believe in him the reason we will also rise is because he will share that life with us there's no prophet that has come to this world that have said with assurance and audacity I will rise again they don't have that power not in Christianity not in any other religion of the world not one only Jesus in all of human history ever declared with boldness and say i will die on the third day i will rose again so when he said it and it happened a proof that he is truly the son of god so that's what the resurrection came to achieve according to romans 1 verse 4 he was proven to be the son of god through the spirit of holiness by power and by the resurrection from the dead the second reason for the resurrection is to validate prophecy because all the apostles said it that he was going to die that he was going to be buried that he was going to rise on the third day if jesus didn't rise it means the prophet lied and if the prophets lies or lied about his resurrection which one are we going to trust them in because the problem with spiritual thing is that if you lie in one how can we trust the other because this thing is about eternity and life is live once we can't be going into eternity and be doing trial and error and so if you speak there must be consistency in everything you utter. And the prophet said many things. And this is one of the things they said. 
number one they said a virgin shall give birth now that is biologically impossible but we saw that it happened the same prophets that say a virgin will give birth the same prophet said this child that the virgin will give birth to will die and will rise again and so if jesus had not risen it means prophecy would have been a lie and if prophecy is a lie the whole of christianity would have been built on a lie but thanks be to god the bible revealed that he rose validating every prophecy and there are three categories of prophecies here number one they are prophecies spoken in types and in shadows that means these ones events took place that conveyed the message when we say type and shadow we mean an event happened but that event conveyed the message of the gospel and i give you one of them in jonah chapter 1 verse 17 the bible said now the lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up jonah and jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights so this was a prophecy in type and shadow the bible eventually revealed to us the meaning prophetic meaning of what happened to jonah and so in matthew 12 verse 39 and 40 he said but he answered and said unto them an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and he said there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of prophet jonah he said for as jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth this is jesus speaking so jesus was validating prophecy in types and in shadows he said the same way jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights he said me too i will be under the earth for three days and three nights so here jesus validated prophecy and he affirmed prophecy from the type and the shadow of prophecy that happened to jonah but there are other prophecies in scriptures i read for you already from psalm 16 verse 19 to 12 verse 9 to 11 the psalmist said you shall not allow my lord to suffer corruption or leave his soul in hades and i showed you how that peter explained the meaning in acts 2 where he said the same the what what okay let's read it psalm 16 verse 9 to 11 quickly he said for thou shall not live my soul in hell this is david speaking he said neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption now these things that david said peter came to explain it check acts chapter 2 verse 37 and see what peter said is it 37 now uh -huh. Acts 2 30 to 32. Help me. Let me see that. Go to verse 29. I want to show you where he quoted David. He said, Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of our patriarch David, that he, both dead and buried, his sepulchre is with us unto this day. He's telling them first, David, who is one of our fathers, has died, and we know his grave. He is buried. He said, but David prophesied that you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. So if David has been buried, what was David saying? Go to the next verse. He said, therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn to an oath that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up christ to sit on his throne are you seeing why romans 1 3 said he's the son of david according to the flesh go to verse 31 he said he seen this before spake of the resurrection of christ that that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption so what peter was explaining here is that what david was saying in psalm 16 verse 9 and 10 is actually the prophecy of the death burial and resurrection of jesus so he affirmed it here so apart from types and shadows actual spoken prophecies were also being fulfilled and finally the ones jesus himself said with his mouth here was jesus speaking john chapter 2 verse 18 to 12 so it was prophesied in type and shadow it was prophesied by prophets and jesus himself said it 
if Jesus had not really risen from the dead every other thing he said would have been a lie and it would have been foolishness to believe any other thing because if he lies in one there is a great probability that he lied in every other thing so this is one thing that validated and authenticated every utterance of Jesus Christ he said then answered the Jews and said unto him what sign shall thou so unto us seeing that thou doest these things now this was when he went to the temple and drove all of them out for selling in the temple and said, so you shall not make my father's the house of prayer a house of woe of, of of merchandise for criminals and so they were now asking him what gave you the authority you are not a, a sanhedrin member you are not a high priest you are not even a leader in the synagogue what gave you the authority to come and flog us while we are doing business in the temple and jesus answered jesus answered and said unto them he said destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up again but the people were not spiritual hear what they said then said the jude 40 and six years was this temple in building will thou rear it up in three days because they thought he was referring to the building but when you read second corinthians 5 verse 3 verse 1 to 3 you saw that paul was calling our body a tabernacle so that was what jesus was saying but they didn't have spiritual knowledge they were blinded by greed they were only taking money from the treasury go to the next verse and see what the disciples said verse 21 hmm. Mm -hmm. who is in the studio he said but he spake of the temple of his body you know how the disciples now got it after he rose because they too were thinking like the jews when he rose they now say oh 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 when he was talking about the temple so it was himself he was talking about they now understood the scripture verse 22 when therefore he was risen from the dead his disciples remembered that he said this unto them and they believed the scripture and the word you see why the disciples believed jesus they didn't believe jesus because he was a philosopher they didn't believe jesus because he was intelligent when they saw that he said he was going to rise from the dead and truly he rose they believed him to the death this is why none of them changed their mind if this man said i will die we saw him die he was buried and he rose up if he had not said it maybe he would have said it's a coincidence it's an act of god but he told us with his mouth i am going to die i will be buried three days later we rise if he rises then i will be willing to die for him because i can believe in him now if he tells me that there's hope in the future if a man who died and did not rise tell you there is hope in eternity why, how will you believe him he has not gone there before and since he went he has not come back so everything he says is an assumption is the one who went there if if i stand outside and i tell you this temple this auditorium here there are gold there go and take what question will you ask me how do you know have you been there before and i'll tell you no i don't know but i i am sure i'm sure you will now start traveling from lagos to come and enter this temple that has gold will you go there but if you see me coming out from inside with gold and i tell you there's more where i took from even before i say go you will say thank you you will go there that's what the resurrection represents that's why peter said we have not believed cunningly devised fables somebody didn't just tell us something by assumption he went to the grave he conquered the grave he rose from the grave and so if he tells us there is hope in eternity we dare to believe I'm not believing Jesus because I'm a Christian in fact I'm not moved by the title of Christianity I believe Jesus because I checked historical facts I checked the Bible and I saw that truly he said he will die and he will wake up after three days and he rose because he rose anything he tells me about eternity I dare to believe if he had not risen I would have been looking for another way but thank God he rose as he said thank God he did not end up 
in the grave thank god we didn't hear stories that something may happen something may not happen the matter of destiny cannot be an assumption because we will be there forever and ever and my forever and ever cannot be an assumption i'm not a fly are you seeing why christianity is very integral in our belief system so jesus said it and he did it the third reason for the resurrection is to activate redemption you know why redemption now comes in because if he's able to save himself then he can save you two of you come I hardly teach with illustration, but let me show you something. Come. Come up. Which of them is look stronger? <laughs> okay. I, I'm looking for a warrior. I'm looking for a giant. That it will be obvious, clearly obvious. Sahi, come. Kai! This body is this size. Come. Sahi, come. Wisdom, well done. You look a bit big, but it's not enough. Both of you sit here. I know you are princes, but pardon me. Pardon my arrogance. Um, Sai, lift this man up. Sit down. Try all your best. <laughs> Give him some sound. He needs energy. Charge him up. Charge him. Charge him up. Lift. Give him sound. You know, he responds to energy. When he's hearing, try your best. Can we donate money to encourage him? If you raise this man up, I will give you a million. Try your best. Don't, don't, we are not acting. Do your best. <laughs> what is happening? Why can't you? Because I'm sitting down. Somewhere. Even you, you need help. <laughs> now, stand up. You know, sit down. Lift him up. Melakwate. Avoro Gavagada. A man who has not risen from the dead cannot tell you anything about eternity. Only the one who entered and came back can tell you something about eternity. Do you see now that size does not matter? All of them were sitting. All of them were helpless. How can a helpless man help another helpless man? Jesus had to rise. It's because he rose. That's why we believe in salvation thank you very much sit down <laughs> so what we believe here is not we are not trying to prove a doctrine or fight for a scripture no this thing is proven they saw him and there are evidences to back it up from scriptures from our personal lives and from history if you leave this service today i give you one assignment go and check online type what are the historical evidences about the resurrection of jesus or type what are the scholarly evidences and find out if you will, if there will be any inconsistency in history if you will find one historian i'm not talking religious people historians who are atheists but are scientists who will come out and tell you that is a lie if you will find one they are studied journals proven and so when jesus tells you if you die you will rise again he knows what he's saying he has conquered death if jesus tells you there is hope in eternity he knows what he's saying he has conquered death and so the third reason for the resurrection is for our salvation sit down i'm rounding up five minutes just give me five minutes and i'm done in acts chapter 5 verse 31 it says him had god exalted with his right hand to be the prince and a savior for to give repentance to israel and forgiveness of sins so god established him as our prince and our savior because he has the authority over the grave in romans chapter 1 verse 4 i read it to you already it said god declared him to be the son of god by the resurrection Romans 4 25 hear what the Bible said he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification 
so when he rose up from the grave he becomes the basis and the reason why you too can believe in eternity and before he rose he first of all carried your punishment for sin and died with it so in him you were judged in him you died in him you were condemned when he rose again he now introduced you his life that life you now live is no longer your life it's his life you are living and so when god looks at you he looks at you in christ jesus when god interacts with you he interacts with you in christ jesus because when you surrender to him he took your life and died with you when he rose from the dead he brought you a new economy of life this is the foundation of faith see what paul said in romans 5 8 to 10 he said god commanded his love towards us that while we were yet sinners christ died for us he said much more being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by his death how much more shall we be reconciled to him by his life so his life has come to us because of the resurrection we now live that life and we operate in that life so the third reason for the resurrection is so that you can receive salvation is so that you can be justified is so that you can receive the life of god in romans chapter 6 verse 4 he said we were buried with him in baptism he said as christ was risen from the dead by the glory of the father he says so you and i shall also walk in the newness of life so resurrection is necessary so that we can receive the life of god paul said if only in this life we have hope we are of all men most miserable he said christ died for our sins so that we can live his life he said for if christ did not rise then our faith is vain so any faith that does not believe in a being that has authority over death paul is saying that faith is most likely vain because there is no true hope everybody is living in assumption and the most dangerous thing you will do at starting eternity is to live in assumption there must be precision and i don't have time to go into more of the intricacies tonight because of that finally what is the fourth reason for the resurrection is for empowerment the resurrection empowers us first way the resurrection empower us is by the infilling of the holy spirit it's after the resurrection that you receive the baptism of the holy spirit in acts chapter 2 from verse 1 the bible says, when the day of pentecost was fully come he said they were together in one accord and suddenly they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and they were filled with the holy spirit and the empowerment began number one it began with boldness when peter went out with the with the other disciples they were afraid before but that baptism gave them boldness that was beyond logic and so they stepped out and started preaching then they saw the second empowerment which is what we call anakazo is the compelling force as peter finished preaching he said they were pricked in their hearts acts 2 37 3, believed and they didn't stop there they now moved into another empowerment in fact the second empowerment they had was the baptism of the spirit the third empowerment they had was conviction they were able to convict men the fourth empowerment is that miracles broke out and suddenly in acts 3 peter was going to the temple and a man that was lame was raised to life then you saw that the dead started rising then you saw that multitude began to come so the moment they received the holy ghost they started graduating from one empowerment to another they spoke in tongues they became bold they 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 they, they, they began to convict the hearts of men they began to heal the sick they began to raise the dead multitude began to come because god plans to empower us but in sin we can't be empowered the holy ghost will only come after we have accepted the verdict of resurrection so after the resurrection came the holy spirit the second empowerment god gave us is the church in matthew 16 from verse 18 he said to them he said that peter upon this revelation i'll build my church peter called him the christ the son of the living god and he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against you so there are individualistic powers and empowerment we have by reason of the holy spirit and there are also corporate powers that we have because we are part of a church and the power of the church is number one the gate of hell shall not prevail number two whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven whatever we lose on earth is loosed in heaven these two dimensions of empowerment are possible because the church became after came after the holy ghost came 
if the holy ghost had not come the church would not have been born so they waited until the holy ghost came so two dimensions of empowerment that the resurrection brings is number one the infilling of the holy spirit which brings you eternal life which brings you faith which brings you the anointing and all of that and then number two is the corporate ranking that the holy ghost gives us as a church there are many things we cannot do as individuals but we can achieve as a church and you saw that in scripture when james when peter was locked up there was nobody that could speak and the gates were open the bible said prayers was made of the church for him and an angel descended and the gates opened and peter was less loose why do you think the church has not been annihilated christians are the most hated people in the world today go and check statistics you'll be shocked christians but when they think we are gone another generation will rise like a swarm of bee it's not because we are doing any special thing to maintain our relevance or population christians we don't marry much most of us are so educated that even giving birth now is fashion some people give birth to two they say ah no 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 it's enough i don't want to lose my shape <laughs> so why we are not giving birth why we are not getting married it's our, our our own belief system say one man one wife so there's no natural strategy of population it is by the spirit it's a move it's a move of the spirit when they kill one ten are born again the moment they killed Saul, they killed Stephen, the anointing rested on Paul. And from there, many others broke open. You heard that Philip went to Samaria, took the whole city. So it's a move of the spirit. Why do you think they've not been able to annihilate us? It's because of the power and the empowerment that comes from the resurrection. Kill one, ten rise. Kill ten, hundred rise. Kill hundred, one million rise. And you are wondering, won't they finish? The world is lucky that we have not finished if we finish the world we end the day god carries us from here the world ends that's the rapture so they are they think they are killing us meanwhile we are the preservation of the earth and you will never hear any christian anywhere say take arms and kill anybody you will never hear anywhere where they encourage you to kill or to do anything evil leave everybody to believe what they want just preach the gospel allow the holy ghost to walk we don't defend our god our god defend us we don't defend our bible our bible defends us so when something is going wrong with a christian john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life romans 8 32 if he did not withhold his only son but gave him freely for us how shall he not with him give us all things and if he has given us all things i decree that my protection is here i decree that my salvation so it's our scripture that defend us we don't defend our scripture does he not suggest to you that what's happening is organically spiritual it's not human power go and read the ancient era of the palestinian government christians were hunted like animals they thought they had finished before you know what is happening the move of the spirit hits the palace a king is converted the move of the spirit hits a village the whole village is converted and you are wondering what is going on here we keep multiplying like a swarm of bees. see the apostles he said peter preached 3,000 was added to the church. The next time Peter preached, 5,000 was added to the church. The next time Peter preached, a great company of the priests became obedient to the faith. The next time Paul preached, the whole city came to them. Acts 2, 47. Acts 4, verse 4. Acts 6, 7. Acts 13, 44. From 3,000 to a whole city. And that's how we have been moving from one generation to another generation. And look at it. What you are looking at that looks as if we are dwindling in Nigeria. Very soon, you will discover under the canopy of darkness, an army is rising. An army, an army is rising. Not too long, the darkness will pass away. And you will think it's daybreak. It's not daybreak, you will see. When darkness lifts, it's not daybreak, you see. It's an army, you see. Because under the canopy of darkness, God is incubating on warriors. And there are those that will sink 
a city will come under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There are those that will preach. Nations will come under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And there are others who don't need to preach. They are mobile signs and wonders. They can enter nations that are forbidden. But when they enter and cry, cripples will start walking. Even the government of that nation, we know that this ones there's something about it. How do you think people like Benihi enter nations that worship stone? Nations that worship moon? Nations that worship idol? When you see power, you can't deny it. The president will invite... See, some of you hearing me on ground and online, very soon, presidents of nations will invite you and say, come and help our country. And you will go there. You will tell them, the answer of the world is not the government. The answer of the world are not technocrats. They are not businessmen. It's Jesus, the son of the living God. Don't worry, you're out of time. I don't want to stare anything here. So the fourth reason for the resurrection is to empower every one of us. Sit down. Please believe this. You know the problem of many Christians? We want to leave the resurrection and go back to rituals. So prayer has turned to rituals. Worship has turned to rituals. We think there's no power in the simplicity. So we want to add something to the works of Jesus. And if you add anything, you can take the glory. There is one man who is praying so that he can be accepted. He's praying so that he can become something. There's another man who knows that he's accepted in Christ. He has become something. So he's praying from acceptance. He's praying from what he is in Christ. They are two different people. The first man we want to take the glory. The second man has no glory to take. Are you seeing the difference? If you come to this place and you want to talk to me to give you money to do something and then you come to this place and you know money is already available and you want to talk to me before you do something hope you know there will be two different conversations. The first one who comes will want to convince me to give him the money. The second one who comes will thank me for giving him the money. So one will function from gratitude and he will forever be indebted. The other one will function from his ability, intelligence, pride and he will want to take the glory if he gets the money. This is the problem with many Christians. We have not accepted what Christ has done. We are trying to do something to add to what Christ has done. And God will not allow it because we will take the glory. When you accept the resurrection, there are few effects that it has. I will just list them because of our time so that we will go. Number one, it will give you power over sins. Anybody who understands and accepts the resurrection naturally begins to live above sin because the power of life is activated. Romans chapter 6 verse 5 to 7, Romans 8 verse 2, Romans 8 11. You'll see that the power of life, the power of the Holy Ghost is activated when you rest in resurrection and in Christ. Number two, the second thing that will happen to you is that you will begin to function in the authority of righteousness. 1 Peter 3 18, Romans 5 17, 2 Corinthians 5 21. You'll see that in the resurrection was imparted into us the gift of righteousness and we were also made the righteousness of God. The third effect of the resurrection is that you begin to enjoy benefits of God and of heaven like divine health. In 1 Peter 2 24 to 25, Isaiah 53 4 to 5, you will see all of that. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes we were healed. When he resurrected, he brought us into that economy of the newness of life. Are you seeing that? So there are many benefits, there are many effects to this doctrine. In fact, the quality of your Christian faith begins to increase if you believe in this thing. And it will, it will be so easy that you will know that God is the one walking in your life. That's when you will truly become a wonder. Number four, benefit of accepting and believing the resurrection it will establish in you a new attitude and purpose for life colossians 3 1 to 4 it says if you are risen with christ seek those things which are above where christ seated on the right hand of god 
set your affection on the things above not on the things of earth he said for you are dead and your life is hidden in christ and christ is in god are you seeing that so it gives you a new attitude and a new purpose towards life in second corinthians 5 14 and 15 say the love of christ constraining us he said for we thus judge that if one died for all they that live no longer live for themselves but they live for him that died for them and that was risen from the dead the fifth benefit that you come into as you believe in the resurrection is that you will become assured that you have victory over death romans 6 5 he said if we have been planted together with him in the likeness of his death we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection so it gives you an assurance of victory over death these are five very solid benefits of believing in the resurrection power over sin ability to live righteous functioning from the realm of the wealth of heaven divine health inclusive establishes in you a new attitude and way of life because of your new consciousness which is heavenly and finally an assurance of victory over death as i'm standing here i know like i know my name that i'm not hopeless not only in time but in eternity i'm not hoping that if i die i will go to heaven i'm not hoping that something good will will await me after i die i know because of christ and because of his finished works i know that if i live here i will go to heaven with god and when the new earth is planted and i return i will return reigning with christ i know that eternally i am saved and i'm not doomed i know as i'm standing now that my future and my eternity is preserved it's not an assumption i know it with all level of certainty i can tell you that i believe in eternity more than i believe in any other thing because i've seen everything jesus said no one fell to the ground from when he walked as a man he looked at the blind he said eyes open they open he looked at the deaf he said ear open it open when he was going to jerusalem he saw a fig tree he said no man will eat of you again the disciples say oh for the first time he has said something that won't happen when they were coming back the next day it withered from its root they were in a boat they were about to drown because of the tempest he stood up and he said peace be still even the wind and the wave hurt him the apostles saw all of those wonders they documented it but the one that blew their mind was the fact that he stood up and told them i will die i will be buried three days later i will rise again peter couldn't take it he called him aside and rebuked him say don't say this thing if you die we are finished he said no if i die you are not finished it's in my death that you will have hope because it's when i resurrect that you will know that even the grave can be conquered because until jesus came no man conquered the grave it is after his death that you will know that everything he told you about heaven you will see it and you know what happened his brothers didn't believe him because his brothers saw him they say ah we were with you all this while what do you mean we know you can do some miracles anybody can perform miracles when jesus rose from the dead james too became an apostle are you not the one that blew their minds the bible said he was talking to them and giving them instructions and he took them to the mountains of olive and he said why they yet looked he said jesus was carried bodily to heaven when they saw it their lives they gave their life as an offering and you know what happened there it's not just gravity he didn't just ascend he ascended and translated if you only ascend you will end up in jupiter <laughs> he ascended and he translated so it's not about ascending somebody can use parachute somebody can use a levitating machine you can ascend and end in pluto you can ascend and end in venus or saturn but he ascended and as the cloud were receiving him he was translated and he entered heaven and as if that was not enough days later peter said i'm going to fish he came back again that means i didn't vanish i'm living in a realm a real realm 
when he finished speaking to them he left again bodily and that's not all many have seen him paul said me too i saw him as one born out of season and paul is not the only one that have seen him even me talking to you i have seen him <laughs> God, God, God.